Welcome and good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you uh, Mr. Alexander Pfeiffer. Uh, he is a head uh, of the Emerging Technologies Experience Lab at the University of Continuing Education, Krems. And we agreed upon that I'm not going to introduce you further because there will be an introduction during the presentation. So uh, the floor is yours and welcome to Klagenfurt. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Thank you for, for having me. Um, it was a wonderful uh, tr 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 uh, way driving here yesterday through the snow and, and, and a perfect day. So our topic today is the digital transformation of education, a hyper-disruptive era through blockchain and gen generative AI. And why hyper-disruptive? It is especially the AI part is coming so fast and there is an inevitable change and not even we, the full-time researchers, can fully understand what's going on and don't speak about the regulators, um, the schools, uh, the university staff, etc., etc., and our students and what they are allowed to do. And this, this is one of the reasons why we are here. I love to talk about three different topics generally, everything around gaming, blockchain and decentralized networks, digital identity and artificial intelligence. And today is, my, I think, one of, it's the first time I tried to merge everything and talk about it in less than one hour. So let's see if this, if this works out. So why we are here today, on the one hand, happy birthday, ChatGPT. A, a year ago, we all started with the first public version of, of ChatGDB. We have been surprised uh, how the system is, is talking to us. We have been surprised how many uh, chat outputs that are not right, but look, look that it is decent uh, information appeared to us. And we all thought about what's next, how is it going to change the way we live, the way we work at the university, the way we study. We all have some sort of, of degrees uh, achieved in our life. We like to apply for jobs or on the other hand we work at the universities. We uh, students um, like to enroll in our programs and then we receive um, certificates like this one from Russia. I'm going to talk about that later in a bit and we have to verify if this is actually a, a, a person which exists and, and, and we have to try to verify that this is an original certificate. And some of us lecture in classes, um, some of us already use AI detection tools. We have to decide ourselves if we believe in the results or not, but at the end we can use it as some sort of, 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 of basis for a discussion. And um, I'm also going to talk about this in some minutes but in, in one of my last lectures on um, scientific theories for beginners, uh, 15 of 17 homeworks have been just generated with JGPT, and then the students just tried to cite the, the page from the book and the information was not uh, fitting together. So that was a huge learning for me, trying to speak to all the students in person and, and, and discuss how we're going to progress uh, in, in the future. And using those AI tools as our little helpers, they make us think that we are already some sort of scientific superheroes, knowing everything. And now even I started to program tools again using ChatGPT and so on and so forth, trying to explore new topics. But then at the end, um, it is a huge clash of realities because we still have to do double checking with every single sentence we get out of uh, fr from the chat system if this is really a uh, useful information. The topic of AI is more and more uh, going also not, not only science to science, but science to public. And uh, two weeks ago on a Sunday, the uh, newspaper Courier had uh, several uh, pages related to the AI topic. For example, the, the title page has been generated from an AI system. They had a page about uh, what would people who already died say due to current events and so on and so forth. And they made one mistake, which, which I already know it happened in the blockchain space already, it says this picture has been generated by the artificial intelligence system. And it's the same with blockchain. All, everyone still says it's the blockchain. And, and the same with, with artificial intelligence or blockchain. It's not one system, it's several systems. Each have been trained in a different way. And you cannot just simply say the AI system. My little boy, two years old, he is already uh, 
he already has, I have to discuss with him the topic of, of, of robots, topic of artificial intelligence. We have two books here. Uh, one is 10 years old and the newest deep toy edition from On the Farm. And while the 10 year old book still has this idyllic situation um, uh, with the cows and, and still human workforce, in the newest deep toy edition we have several robots doing the jobs like cleaning up, feeding the cows, uh, petting them, automatically uh, taking the milk and so on and so forth. And so the, the two and a half year old boy is, is always asking me like in the morning when he eats his yogurt if, a, if an AI or a robot uh, was responsible to actually make his, his breakfast. And then we have to think about how do we actually meet AI systems and, and androids and, and robots and the digital agents from what we mostly think or just if, if you ask people on the street they would say oh there's a robot coming and talking to you this is Sophia um, and, and I had the pleasure to meet her some years ago in, in Malta and, 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 and uh, be, uh, be backstage um, how, how the, the show worked when Malta introduced their artificial intelligence strategy. And I learned that there are obviously not one Sophia, but many of them, they're all connected through a decentralized network. And that is why there can be a Sophia in Dubai, a Sophia in Malta, and a Sophia in New York at the same time. All learning all training the system through the experiences and most of the, of the discussions that happened on stage have at that time still been pre-scripted so that the Sophia says to the minister, oh, you're just a smart looking young person and it's not saying something, oh, there's been a car bombing in Volta recently, what is your response to it? So they still pre-scripted the, the parts where maybe the AI system would say something, something wrong. But most of the time when we speak about AI systems, it's just source code, source code that we work with every day in our life, uh, from the root planner to basically most of the electronic systems that we use that are not just simply pre-programmed. This was one of the first images that I created with DALI uh, one and a half years ago. If uh, every single dot represents uh, a part um, from, from AI and what you need to learn about it, I guess that I'm capable to talk about four different um, aspects, smart contracts and blockchain, digital identity and AI, AI in gaming, and AI from a humanities perspective. And now we start with part one, the, the blockchain part, and what was my rabbit hole, it was already in 2012, 2013, when I was an editor of the book uh, Game Crime, and through that work I had the chance to investigate money laundering using uh, Bitcoin, um, from the sales of digital gaming items. Unfortunately, it took four more years until 2016 since I discovered uh, blockchain and smart contracts simply as a matter of database and storing data aside the, 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 the cybercrime part and aside the speculation hype. So the Bitcoin community has this claim, it's, it is uh, called don't trust verify and this is why I now like to speak about certificates. This was basically uh, the start uh, some years ago uh, when, when, when I thought, oh, if I had, so this, this was uh, a person applying, studying game studies from, from Russia. And through the process of verification, I was simply calling um, uh, the, uh, the, the gaming company, the person applying said she's working at, I found out that most of the documents and that she sent in to study at the University of Krems have been manipulated. And it was my due diligence and, and my gut feeling that I did further research. Maybe some other person would have just have signed, oh, this looks like a certificate from Russia. There was even from a notary uh, an a, a official English translation. I, I didn't check if the notary itself exists, but it showed me that it is easier than I thought to enroll in a postgraduate master's at the university if the documents that you present look per perfectly. So this year in March, I asked uh, our student service center if we, we are allowed to check original certificates and they, uh, uh, this is the next slide, and they said uh, no, uh, because we, we have to ask every student applying for the, in the enrollment process if they allow us to do the verification process. So my suggestion is simply to an uh, opt-in or opt-out box where we are automatically allowed to do this and if we do it or not is our decision. 
That's for my MBA transcript from the Alaska Pacific University and the process when I enrolled at the University of Malta some years ago. And basically you just had to send all the certificates via email. Then you had to fly in and check it hol holding the certificates through the light. And on the certificate it says it's an original um, if, if on the side it's printed on blue paper. So maybe if I just print the certificate on green paper and I write on the certificate it's an original printed on green paper, someone would, would believe me and, and you can really, that, that's not a tip, so please don't do it. But people can <laughs> maybe easily f have people with a catch me if you can attitude can do so. And this was this light that I have here. Um, I was a consultant at, at an incubator program and one person applied as she is having a PhD. Then I got the tip that she has no PhD, but I was not allowed to check it only again with the permission of the student itself. And even the government said, uh, we are not going to enforce it because having a PhD is not a requirement to get the grant money. A long story short, she did not get any grant money. Those are the, my certificates from Austria uh, so far. Before the G GDPR um, change from the European Union, all the documents had a DVR number, but that basically only said this data has been processed digitally at a particular institution. It does not state that this is actually an original uh, document. So if you're old enough, like me, 44, and then you like to throw the document, again, this is not a tip, just something we have to be aware of, just look up the DVR number that your institution had at that time and print it um, on the bottom of the certificate. So we all have to give grades. That's where we would go into the direction of the micro-credentials. If we believe that at a certain point of time we have this full learning history, every, every single grade that you receive in your life should actually be on a token that has digital signatures and that you can use, for example, to enroll at another university or show your future boss what you have achieved. In the US, they are one or two steps ahead. Usually in regards to digital identity, they are not. Um, they still have their social security card and you have to keep your number secret and there's a lot of fraud related to that. But when it comes to credential verification, the moment you enroll in most of the programs nowadays, you allow them that they even hire a third party to check all the certificates that you presented during the enrollment process. And we have seen a, a lot of fraud in regards to manipulation. The famous one was some years ago, 2019, when the database of the SAT scores uh, had been manipulated. I guess you have all read it simply, uh, even in the Austrian newspapers, that the kids from famous actors have been enrolled into elite colleges and basically the famous actor actresses just paid um, a person some money so that they go into the database and, and check and, and change uh, the, the grading so that they can pass the enrollment uh, process. And sometimes it just takes uh, some time. So in 2010, we have um, the law in Austria that we can sign uh, certificates digitally using uh, the AMT signature, which uh, uh, each university or each school should have. And we needed actually Corona that 11 years later, one of the first schools in, in Vienna, the Handelsakademie, um, the Vienna Business School, started to also issue a digital version of their certificates using the AMT signature. So 11 years from actually allowed by law and the first institution uh, do doing so. And this is quite a shame because in Austria with the AMT signature we would have been able now for, for 13 years already that every certificate that we hold in our hands would be a digital original document signed uh, with the AMT signature. Again, Malta, they, they received the issue if you are a pi piloting something, if, if, if you're a pioneer, they paid a lot of money um, to the company uh, which, which was a spin-off of MIT. Um, uh, it was called a learning machine. They created a system as a, as, a, as a white label solution that you can, for example, purchase as a government to create digital cert certificates and learning credentials. But then we know in Malta we had a huge uh, political scandal, um, the change of government and so on and so forth. And several hundred thousand euros have been spent on a system which is no longer in use. And also the company learning machine has been bought by another company. And those are the reasons why 
it was a very good start and, and a, a good idea, but it's, it's no longer there. So sometimes if you are a pioneer, things can obviously also go wrong. And in, in Germany, I think one of the, the most important in, uh, initiative is blockchain for education from the Fraunhofer Institute. They are also working a lot on um, blockchain and educational credentials. <coughs> now let's, let's come to, to my work. I'm in the field of game-based learning and assessment. Um, and uh, in the last years at, at MIT, uh, we created a game. It was called Gallery Defender to actually store the achievements from a game which also has an assessment part on a blockchain-based token. And again, there is a need for that. So from my history, uh, the screenshot is just generated. I didn't manage to keep the, a game from the 1990s running. It was called CAPS. Uh, it was an exam at the University of Economics. And you had to send uh, uh, a file to your professor. But uh, some students found out that you can simply open the file with a text editor and change everything which is in the file and give yourself an A+. I did not do that. I had, of course, an A+, just uh, doing the simulation. But, but others uh, frauded it. So, um, so this was one of the ideas from my end that if we gamify in regards to gamification and assessment our school system, we need to ensure that there is no, no possibility to fraud the results uh, if you look at, 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 at the, um, the file where you extract uh, the important information like your grade. It's the, the, the JSON file can be maybe manipulated. If it's just a text file, it can be mani manipulated. So I thought we need some sort of tokenized system in the school system where you can do game-based assessment or e-learning and assessment and store the, 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 the grading in a way that the student, but also not the teacher, can manipulate the, the data uh, afterwards. That was one of my biggest achievements so far during the MBA program, and I'm super proud of it. And the only thing I have left in my hands is a screenshot. <coughs> this was a business simulation with 1,241 teams um, participating, and my team uh, scored second. Um, you see the, the grading on top, so we had 82 points uh, overall, and the next group from our university at seven, 27 points. So we, we have playing the simulation really, really great and with a lot of care. But, and I would love to have some sort of certification, but it's just uh, the screenshot. So having a token here, showing it to my future boss that I'm really good in you know, planning things and, 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 and as a project planner maybe, and also, also as, as a scientist would, would, be, would be amazing. Some games that we have developed so far, like also Thomas is here in the audience today, Ludwig, the Umweltzeichenspiel, Green Battle, most of them won a lot of awards. Most of them are also used for assessment, even the board games. But it's, for example, for Ludwig, it's just in a centralized database. And the moment the company would shut down their database, the grades are no longer existing unless uh, you have screenshots or whatever that the school or the student um, saved. So, um, for me, blockchain is nothing else, and that's, I think, important than a database protocol that we, that we can use to store sensible data and that we can use to actually prove digital identity of the issuer or the recipient of the particular data. And to do so, we know certain forms of digital identities, unsecure ones like your Twitter ID, your Facebook ID, etc and secure ones like uh, the Handy Signature or now the EID Austria, all regulated from the EIDAS uh, um, regulation from the European Union in 2014. The huge issue is the moment you work overseas, like with the US, and I've been teleworking for MIT uh, several, uh, uh, well, at least one and a half years, and uh, when they wanted something official for me, they preferred a fax more than sending a document uh, with, the, uh, the, with the European safest way to prove that you know, I signed a particular document. So we are, we are very, very far away from a worldwide solution when it comes to, to electronic identities. And some of this solution could again be blockchain based. So the W3C Foundation, they have um, a proposal how this can look like on different blockchain systems. There are commercial uh, solutions for that. They charge you a lot of money for things that you can 
probably do if you're capable of and, and knowing about it a little bit by yourself. So that might be the future, but unfortunately the, 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 the general topic of blockchain is perceived in a very bad manner from the decision makers because of the speculation hype, because of the fraud, uh, because of the energy consumption, um, uh, which, which is always in, in the media uh, all the time. To, to run an educational blockchain system, um, we also have to think about uh, very quickly how you can run blockchain systems. Uh, and, and, and basically, there are full public blockchain. Every transaction, you have to pay your transaction fees. Then there are consortium blockchains, like let's say all the universities in Austria are running a blockchain system on their self. They store and verify the data of the other institutions, and we can store the learning credentials that way. Or just one institution, like the University of Klagenfurt or University of Krems, is running a blockchain system just within the institution, giving reading rights or access rights to um, permission or permissionless blockchain. That's the keyword here to uh, the your, your students. And one huge learning from my end is uh, something called anchoring, which means that you can run your um, consortium-based blockchain. It will save you a lot of cost. It will save you a lot of energy. But every time you produce a new block within your consortium-based blockchain, you send the transaction hash of this block as a transaction on a public blockchain. So you can have 10,000 uh, transactions in 10 minutes on your own system, and then you just do one transaction with the transaction hash of this block to a public system, and this can prove that the, in, that the information on your very own blockchain cannot be manipulated afterwards. It's a very simple trick. It does not cost a lot of money, and maybe this might be the future on how we can use blockchain systems efficiently. <laughs> and when it comes especially to public blockchains, there are different ways on how a consortium is reached from proof of work. We know about that, Bitcoin, Litecoin, the proof of stake, and delegated proof of stake. And delegated proof of stake means that there's a human side, so there's still human decision makers deciding about updates of the system and so forth, and so on and so forth. And if we run a consortium-based blockchain, we would, of course, just use a proof of stake blockchain system um, copy it, run it on our own computers, um, because it would not make any sense to run it with a proof-of-work algorithm. And in this case, we also have to speak about different types of tokens, and the most important one for us, uh, and unfortunately there's no official public taxonomy uh, on how we actually call the different types of tokens, so this is something I, I try to put up for myself, and I'm mainly working with the green one, the non-tradable utility, non utility tokens, meaning that if we store any learning credential on a token, we as the creator of the token decide what is going to happen with the token through approval models. So we don't want the, uh, our, uh, our grades that we give to our students to be sold against Bitcoin on a network, for example. So we are, we are very strict and, 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 and most of the times, one token will just say in one particular wallet, which might hopefully be the student wallet. And from a technology side, NFTs is something that we have to, to have a closer look at. And unfortunately, again, the art sector has um, driven the word NFT uh, to, to something uh, which is again perceived as, as, as a Fraud, fraudulent blockchain token you should not invest in, whatever, but, but we have to separate NFT from the art market and from what have, has happened the last years. NFT does simply mean that you have on the one hand um, a decentralized server for media files, and on the other hand you have the blockchain-based token with its unique ID stored on a blockchain, and then while creating the token you put the IP, the ID address from the media file and include it in the token, so you know that you always refer to this digital original, which in our case can simply be any kind of certification. And if you do that on a public blockchain, uh, you would reduce the blockchain bloat, meaning the data that you store on a blockchain system. Two different types of smart contracts, I think this is also a huge learning. Um, you have two different types, one is uh, pure smart contracts, like we know it from Ethereum, you have program code, you can design any kind of smart contract you like, you, you like uh, to create. But uh, when we read in the media that the blockchain system has been hacked, it's usually not the blockchain itself, but it's the smart contract running on the blockchain. So if you 
digitalize any of your processes as a university or as a company through smart contracts and you use the pure form of smart contracts, you need perfect peer review uh, of the source code before you execute it on a public blockchain system. The other part, this is uh, on, on the left, this is um, smart transaction or lightweight smart contracts then basically there the code that you can work with is already part of the blockchain system itself. So it is like playing with Lego. You're limited to a certain way, but for me, everything that I've done so far can be done with lightweight smart contracts. And of course it is much more secure because you're not creating new code. You're just putting existing pieces of codes together and, and try to describe what your um, smart contract should look like. Now let's speak about Gallery Defender. My prototype I'm quite uh, proud of, um, which has been developed by the Texas A&M Life Lab. At the time I was at the MIT Educational Card in association now also with Danube University and the University of, of Malta. And the main idea is you have a, a game and I also have the link, you can play it later as your homework if you like to at home. And um, you can either use our, our default uh, blockchain address or create a new one. There's an introduction how, how to do it. You don't even need to play the game. You, there's a screen where you can um, test all the functions. And the main idea is that we have one level where you can practice, where you can simulate the exam, and where you can actually take the exam. It's about the topic of art styles. The moment you say, I'm going for the exam, you only have, for example, four trials uh, to, to do so, like vier Prüfungsantritte. And uh, you get this alert that your score will be recorded on blockchain. Are you sure you, you, you like to continue? This is not a game-based learning class, so we make this very short. The main idea is that you are the owner of a gallery. You have an AI agent who is trying to steal um, uh, the paintings from you. And you need to have two trials correct that you get one point against <coughs> the AI system. And then at the end, um, you completed it and you get the screen with the uh, time you needed to complete the game. In this case, I have 10 answers correct, one wrong, and they would have uh, 90 points, which is an A grade. At that moment, someone finishes the assessment. Um, three different tokens in this particular use case would be created at exactly the same time. One goes to the teacher, one goes to uh, the learner, and one goes to the in institution, and uh, the learner that the teacher has to approve the, the, the process and needs to sign with his identity that this is actually one of his students or, the, or her students which, um, which played the game. So this is how we combined also the part of digital identity and digital signatures in the process. Um, so we have the screen on the right and then on the left side you see the, uh, the, uh, the message which is um, encrypted in this case, uh, someone has already input his or her um, private key to s actually look into the information of the token. And this is also something very important that as it is on a public blockchain, the data that a transaction itself has taken place is public. So everyone can look into the tra transaction ID, but this does not include any kind of private data, a name, the grade, whatever. So you need your master key to actually decrypt the message and, um, and, and look into the private data. And then you can create shared keys. So for example, if you apply for a job, you can create a shared key, you can connect it with an email address and allow this person to just look into the information stored on a particular token for, for a time frame. And it's recorded, so just look into the recording and here you find um, the possibility to create, um, oh, this is the testnet version uh, so basically you don't need to spend any money, you can create a wallet yourself, you can go onto our, our website. It has had an uptime of 100% since uh, mid-2019, so I hope it is not shutting down the moment you like to, to, to test it, but such things can happen as we <laughs> had recently experienced in one of our lectures with, with another system we worked with. And so we played around with storing blockchain tokens and credentials a lot. Uh, we created an e-learning quiz where actually each token is, a, each learning um, result is a different token. In the Gallery Defender example, we created several hundred million tokens, which at the moment uh, you add the metadata gets, so to say, uh, the unique token with the unique information. 
We tested a lot with um, live exams in the corona times and how we can uh, program digital agents representing a certain role at the university with the huge stream that at the moment someone has its master thesis defensio and all the grades are already here in the wallet of, of the student and then some minutes after he or she passes the exam uh, a signed token will be transferred into the token of the learner and he or she can call herself master of arts in the application process. Now it takes at the University of Krems about three to four weeks until this person can actually call him or herself a master of arts and because we need a lot of real life signatures on paper to make this process, process happen and all these signatures are at the end based on trust. So of course the rector has not been there at the exam, the dean has not been there at the exam, they just trust me or Thomas or us three together signing the first document and then the others maybe blindly at the, the signatures. So I think something like that can be done through digital agents and randomly, um, let's say one out of ten in, in, in a random manner, certificates will also be um, um, checked in a, the old school manual process. And this is now where we're going to switch from the storing data part on a blockchain system to AI. And that's, that's uh, basically one of my most important uh, learnings from my work the last years, or what I like to achieve, is that we have an electronic ID wallet which, where we can store blockchain-based tokens uh, with a particular function like our health data, our learning credentials, our concert tickets we can decide which kind of digital identity we use in, the, uh, in different use cases depending on the need of the quality of the, of the electronic identity of a person and then our digital agents can, can use uh, that information to deal with other digital agents so human, um, uh, robot, robot AI interactions or we feed a digital agent directly as a human being or we allow other human beings uh, to access our data. So for example, you have your health data on tokens. Um, every visit to your doctor, every issue on a different token, but then you have an, an accident, a car accident, um, and then the emergency, emergency doctor can unlock the, your health information with his private key. But the moment you get an alert that an emergency doctor tried to unlock your data so that he cannot uh, be at the party and, and show the private data of other people. That is where I had a consultancy session in the UK, for example, to speak about that particular uh, process in the future there. Um, so I think it has a lot of potential, but we are not there yet. And we are not yet. We are there already from a technical perspective and standpoint and what is possible, but we are not there yet from a perception of us, the researcher, and the decision makers, and so on and so forth. So now comes the introduction part. I'm half time of the talk, 30 minutes. This, is, uh, this sums up the last years of, of my life. On the left side, my American life, my Austrian life, and my Maltese life. And this would be basically the data set if an AI system like ChatGPT or Bing, etc., look up my life and try to describe who I am. So this is yet. This is a little bit um, uh, going into the past, uh, beginning with the first time Bing AI was available in, in Austria and I asked who am I and I even was nice to the AI system, I gave the AI system my link to my digital CV to help it a little bit to, because there are many Alexander Pfeiffers, it's a very common name and most of the Alexander Pfeiffers work actually in the educational sector and write books. It's really crazy, but if you look at Alexander Pfeiffer, we, it's maybe <laughs> we're all clones and we do more or less the same work. Um, but it, it, it did a lot of things wrong, although I helped Bing maybe exactly one year ago f f uh, that this experiment happened. It said that I have a doctor in Bildungswissenschaften, I have it in economics. <coughs> it says that I'm very, very good uh, or that I offer loan and uh, bookkeeping services. Please do not give me your bookkeeping data, I, I'm not really good at this, I, I need someone to help, help me, although I have a Wirtschaftswissenschaftlichen Abschluss. So I continue and, and um, I, so the, the next time I ask it, three weeks later, again, 
uh, the AI system said that I am the founder of the MIT Playful Lab Europe, which I would love to be, but I'm not. And it mixed up, it hallucinated that I found this together with Konstantin Mitkuc. And Konstantin Mitkuc, actually one of my first projects at the University of Krems 2006 was that I had to present Konstantin Mitkuc's work because he was sick. And Konstantin Mitkuc was also a Mexicate Austrian at MIT long before me. And he's a good friend, but that's all we have in common. And, um, and it really mixed up that we both are the founder of the lab and so on and so forth. And then I ask, um, I, I know Alex Pfeiffer, he didn't tell me that, that he, he is the co-founder of this lab. And I also have a master in game studies from MIT. So it's, it's very interesting. And then the AI says, we could ask me, how good do you know Alexander Pfeiffer? And I say, I, I know him, I, we are good friends from school. And the AI said, oh, that's nice. Uh, I, I'm sure you have a lot of memories. And then I said, I just called Alexander. Uh, he is really, um, you know, I have some, some, some bad words I don't want to say in front of the camera, but he's worried that, that you halluc hallucinate and that you're lying. And then this is what typically happened with being at that time. It switched to English and say, you're no longer going to work together. And you see there's a cap of, that you uh, have been only allowed for 10 prompts so then things that you ask the AI, because at that time the AI systems have gone very widely. And there was this famous story from this New York Times um, reporter where Bing uh, said, uh, you should marry the Bing AI system and he should divorce from, from the wife. That was one of the most famous story at, at that time. Some weeks later again, the answers from Bing AI got better and better and, and really accurate, I have to say. Then next system, the paid model of ChatGPT. Again, my prompt, and this is always, <coughs> if you give a, a prompt information uh, to the AI system, this is where it starts to build the text and to predict the, the most common uh, word, which, which might fit to that particular topic. So I said, I'm Alex Pfeiffer from the University in Krems from MIT. Uh, please uh, provide me with the most uh, decent work and, and references. And, None of the three papers it provided exists, but the topics are exactly what I'm working with. It's gamification and blockchain. And one of the co-authors, which appeared two times, is Simone Kriegelstein from the Austrian Institute of Technology. She exists and we publish together. But at the end of the day, it's not. Uh, and we published before the cap from ChatGPT in September 2021. So that information is on ResearchGate, is on Google Scholar. But at the end, it just mixed up any the DOI numbers that do not exist. And I asked why it is doing so, and at the end it said, uh, basically, it's, it is just predicting what, it does not have the information, it's just predicting what I'm doing. And if I present this on a conference, I, I have to be honest that it's actually made up what it is saying. And at that time I received emails, uh, please uh, provide me with the paper that you wrote with Mr. Korana, Blockchain Games, A New Opportunity for Gamification. And then I looked on Twitter at that time if others experienced the same. And yes, this was quite a thing. A lot of researchers received emails and requests for papers that they did not write, just because ChatGPT made those papers up, making the user believe that this is proper information. In the course of time, the systems evolved, and, and then uh, even ChatGPT had access to Bing AI in a better version, then they removed it again, and now you have, you have access again to it. But then you had the possibility to actually provide the links, and from the information it ex extracted, you see that, that basically that the amount of made-up information uh, decreased uh, sig signific significantly. So this, this would actually be some text that I would use on a CV about my life. And we have this new feature, creating a permalink, and we talk about this in a bit. Uh, when it comes to the section, how can we work with the system together with our students? What do we allow? What do we permit, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. When it comes to papers, you can use certain plugins nowadays, which actually gives you access to real paper databases, and therefore the system does no longer need to lie to you because through the plugin uh, the information is accurate. Let's switch to the next AI system, BART. Not at that time available in, 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 in Europe. But this is a good friend of mine, Kim Harris, from the New York University. And she wrote me an email. Uh, she was not Googling what I'm doing. She was barding me. 
and the system said that I created a game for elderly people in regard to mathematics and she would love to have access to that game and I did not do such a game but we started to talk again and had a lot of fun chatting. Um, so when part several months later, this is just in, in summer, this uh, from, from, from the 13th of July when part was available in, in Austria, I thought that with this half a year that, that Google waiting half a year until they release the version in, in Austria, the system needs to get better and better, but not. It was the most horrible experience asking who I am and what the system you know, provided me ab about my very own life. Um, so, so to sum it up, we can say that we have uh, the Wild West AI systems that are allowed everything. Then they got bored to a certain extent. The information is, uh, is, is usable. But at the end, they just want to be your little doggies and pleasing you, the masters. Um, and they're not, s nowadays more and more, but let's say up to October this year, they would never say a sentence like, I don't know about that. So when we go to the history of AI very, very shortly, I'd just like to say that pretending something is, is, is part of humanity. The most famous device is maybe the Schachtürke, which was uh, from 70, uh, 70 to 1854 in operation, pretending it's a machine that can play chess. And then there are several stories why um, this mysterious machine got, got uh, unveiled, why there's a person sitting in it. Um, one story says there was a fire at an exhibition and they basically said, please come out of the machine, we don't like you to be burnt alive. Um, and then people knew that this was just a trick for, for over 60 years, 70 years actually. When it comes to computer games, we gamers or game developers always are in favor of new technologies. So we can say games like Duck Hunt or Space Invaders are the first approaches of adaptive gaming, um, which would be in the education sector, maybe adaptive learning and assessment in a very, very early stage, um, adapting to the human behavior of the player and not just simply running um, uh, pre-programmed code. Different games and AI in 1996 uh, when Deep Blue um, beat uh, Kasparov, but Schach is when it comes to the rule sets, when it comes to predict the next move, a perfect game for AI system to learn and to work um, as intended. But still, mid 90s, this was this was a huge milestone. Go, a game where for many years everyone said it will never be possible for AI systems to be the human player, but then in 2015 it happened the first time. Um, uh, the, the European champion of Go, uh, Fan Hui, has been beaten by, um, by AlphaGo. Um, so this was a huge milestone and uh, we were able to see that a, a huge wave of new AI systems will will come to us. And then for me, they, and excuse the word, the what the fuck moment was on the 16th of April, 2019, I gave a talk in Malta about the future of AI. And the night before I was watching an AI system live from OpenAI, beating the world champion in Dota 2. And, uh, Dot and, and such games like Dota 2 or StarCraft, uh, they are even much harder to build an AI system on because actually, what you can do within the game is extremely complicated and you have a lot of different aspects that you need to combine. And uh, what a surprise, OpenAI started their, 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 their trainings and their learnings from the company through, through the gaming sector. And uh, we see here that the progress 2016 to 2019 from a very amateur level to actually a world-class player without cheating. So it is the same conditions as any human players. Other games that we need to look at as AI researchers are Elite, uh, one of the first games uh, and, and all the pictures are just uh, generated so that we don't have any uh, copyright issues with the recording today. Um, they, and we can discuss about that later, but, <laughs> but at least uh, the gaming companies are not going to, to, to sue me. Um, uh, procedural generated gaming worlds, so all the gaming worlds that are in the game are generated the moment the player uh, sees them. Or what might be important for self-driving cars is pathfinding algorithms, like we have a very advanced one with Ellie from um, The Last of Us. That's also from OpenAI, hide-and-seek game um, about uh, um, uh, reinforcement learning. 
Um, and we have basically only the, the game rules and the game environment and through playing hundred thousands of times against it itself, the digital agent, the actors, learn the behavior, for example, blocking the doors or later on moving the triangle inside the other room, then blocking the doors so that the person trying to seek them cannot touch them. We have in the gaming world a lot of fake AI, like with civilization uh, in the, let's say, 500 years uh, before Christ, you want to, you, you limit it, uh, your opponent to just one small city, and then some hundred years later they come with, the mod mo with modern war technology, but from the game mechanics it would not be possible that they can build such things. Um, or Mario Kart, uh, your opponents, if you're a really good Mario Kart driver, they, um, they basically have the best items. And there's also one, one example here uh, with, with, with civilization, and Sid Meier itself says it's not a bug, but um, that's the Gandhi story, the moment you developed uh, um, democracy, um, Gandhi, had some, some, some people reported that Gandhi got rogue and was firing around uh, nuclear bombs or whatever was, was the, the, the opponent was, was capable of at that particular point of time. And if you say that, that the score of how the AI opponent reacts is from one very calm to then going crazy, um, maybe Gandhi was on a one, then you invented democracy minus one and it got on the other side on 10, and this was not intended. But Sid Meier in his monography said, this is not a bug, this is something that also might happen. So let's, let's switch to, to MidJourney and ChatGPT for the last maybe 15, maximum 20 <coughs> minutes. Um, so this is a picture that, that my mother, she's already 80 plus, painted. And in the Corona times, we made a lot of fun because we were part of a research project for an NFT platform, which, which is not there for speculation purposes, uh, but, but for, for us researchers, for example, to store the learning credentials. And I first tested the outpainting function so in the red frame, you see the original painting from my mom, and then just with text prompts and overlapping the outpainting frame, uh, the AI system, Dali at a very early stage, recreated the style of, of my mom. And I think this was quite impressive. And even she said, uh, what a time to live in that just with a mouse click, you can you know, en enlarge her, uh, her ideas. At the same time, we were running a game on Twitter. Um, uh, like, like er everyone, who, who loves to, was able at that time to also be a player and to write the storyline. And outpainting helped me a lot. So this, in the red frame, you see a picture from Konsti, our designer. And I used Dali to create assets that then painted uh, by Constantine have been used in the game. So we did not, he did not use the I created version, but it helped me in the communication process. And uh, then Photoshop jumped in, uh, and Adobe is also saying that we are the only honest AI provider when it comes to art, because we know, own all the licenses and <coughs> all the, the training data. And this is again a picture from my mom with the out outpainting function uh, using generative fill in Photoshop. Something that then later on Midjourney also implemented, that within Midjourney you can, you can just um, fill any part of the picture and with a text prompt, for example, here I said, no people, just landscape. We also have the describe function. You upload a picture and then you get a suggestion what the AI system thinks is on the picture itself. And then I tried to, so this is how I can paint the maximum level on the top. And then Midjourney transferred it um, to, uh, to actually quite decent uh, pictures that you can use. And the zoom out function, you upload a picture, you generate one, and you zoom out and the AI basically uh, predicts what is on the other parts of the pictures if you move the camera away. Stable diffusion, this is an, a real painting from my niece, 13 years old, and the third algorithm is, is basically, so we have Midjourney Mid as, as one of the most important providers, Dali of course, and then stable diffusion from hug Hugging Face, and there you can also upload the picture and see what's on the picture itself. So this is also like one, one and a half years ago. And then you can use again this prompt to generate new pictures. But nowadays there's a huge change. If with the newest version of DALI I like to create a picture, 
it does not allow me to do so because of the words that is, are in the original prompt, like streaming on Twitter, Monkey Island, and the names of the famous uh, painters. So Dali said, oh no, due to co copyright infringement, I'm not going to, um, to create a picture for you. And another important um, functionality with AI and art is uh, blending. So you can, for example, upload up to four pictures and then it merges it to a new person. And we speak about fake news in some minutes. So uh, this is just uh, that, that uh, to think about that. At the University of Krems, in the lectures, we have been playing with that topic a lot. Uh, even before Midjourney, before ChatGPT, with this person does not exist. Uh, this was an NVIDIA research project, and every time you press the enter button, you got a new face. And in Christmas 2022, with the students, we started to zoom in, zoom out with that picture, combine it with the lower body of one of our, our students, and then we created our first virtual fake persona just through AI and the Lenser app. The Lenser app made millions of euros at that time with people uploading their pictures. And the moment you uploaded your, your picture, basically you gave them the full rights of your face data. You grant them the rights to use the generated pictures the moment you post them. And there have been a lot of scandals of people uploading their, the pictures of their kids and so on and so forth. Um, but because the only... Um, there was only at, at the screen where you could upload your pictures to say, please do not upload nudity or kids' pictures, but of course people were cap capable to do so. So this is something that can really go wrong if it's just a new information screen. So at that time, hundreds of thousands of users paid a company with money on the one hand and with the facial data on the other hand. If you have any AI system acting for on behalf of your company or on behalf of your university, please train them in a way that such things cannot happen. And this is a real example. The bank AI says, I'm here to help you. The client says, I got scammed. The bank AI says, wow, great. Um, then we had many, many stories from companies using ChatGPT in its earliest version to generate content, even MSN blog writing fake stories, uh, AI-based recipes, uh, which, which basically involve ingredients <coughs> which would kill you immediately. So all those things happened the last uh, month. And then people started to write uh, text that this text has been written by an AI, but for example, someone um, uh, from, from, from some journalists at least had, had a look at this. We have a lot of fake books. This is a five euro Amazon fake book just generated from the AI, then I, I send it back. So I, I bought it and, and for the pictures and then I send it back. But this is what we see a lot because of the print-on-demand feature of Amazon. And we have the first big issues with data that has been generated by ChatGPT. Then someone published it, and in the new training data of those AI systems, it is um, included as a verified data which has been published somewhere. And this is a devil, a devil circle, so to say, because the AI system reading an information in the New York Times and, and, and the New York Times is a, a verified good source. It thinks it can include the data, but in this case, the New York Times wanted to prove exactly that case, and they wrote a fake news article based on ChatGPT. Another huge issue is bias. So we can talk about that alone one hour, but based on the IP address, based on your Google login, and all the information the systems have about you, the, 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 the text prompts you get, the, uh, the pictures you get based on your prompts are are extremely biased, and this is something we have to take a lot of care of. And of course, such things had to happen, like make your dream girlfriend, chat with her, et cetera, et cetera. Fake news in regards to pictures. Um, everything is just generated. So in this case, you would see that this is not the real New York, because those buildings are not at the exact place. It is just a generated picture. But for example, in the left upper corner, if it is a blurred motel in the background, you would not see it immediately. You have to look on the ears, the, the fingers are, are something that the eye system still cannot do in a, in a proper manner. Necklaces, for example. Um, and then I'm not doing the game yet if you due to time constraints, but this is what I do usually in class, that they have to guess which one is the, the original painting or the original photo. And for example, with a persona like Lady Gaga, it's quite hard to guess because we can say even her original press photos May, might contain AI 
components uh, already. So this is, this is my, myself, the, the real picture left is the generated me and on the right side we have the Photoshop mobile app um, and one other clue is just always look into the eyes because the eye generated eyes always look maybe too perfect and, and if you are 44 already and you eat hamburgers uh, your eyes don't, don't look that perfect. For cats and dogs we have a lot of training data so that one is really hard to guess and the most time I play this game in the classroom People say that the cat number two is the original cat, but in fact it's number one. So the more training data you have about a particular topic, the more accurate the result is. And if there is no training data, like with synchronized swimming, uh, at the moment it's you're not able to create or to generate a proper picture on synchronized uh, swimming. And this is an example with a huge impact. Uh, that's the founder of um, the Binance um, Exchange for Cryptocurrencies, one of the most wealthy persons on the planet. And this is also where a lot of people guess it wrong because one is the generated picture. And if you are in the crypto space, you would see it maybe because of the logo. But on the other pictures, like he's on the big stage with the mudas, or here the hands look a big, bit creepy. Um, and th this had a lot of impact because the in, in last summer when the American authorities tried to start um, the first process to take Binance to court, a lot of fake pictures uh, with the founder have been generated and this is a tweet from him and even one fake picture was that perfect that it showed him with an AK-47 shooting the police uh, trying to arrest him. Um, and this is just July 2022 to May 2023 so maybe an update in one year from now we would have full animated uh, pictures of people that are alive and for that pictures I do not use I did not use face swapping so I did not use any original data any data that I provided the AI system the more famous a person is the more data the AI system has and the more accurate the, 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 the face is but of course it is never the exact same face it is only a reproduction of the algorithm the face represents I guess that he said has uh, something has spoken to mid journey because if you like to generate pictures of him now, you get things like that. Um, so this candle had some sort of, of impact. And this is something I did with, uh, with Alex Arman from Standard last summer, where we tried to prove that uh, based on, 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 on this famous ad from T-Mobile, from uh, that, that based on just one picture, you can recreate like kids picture of a person. And this is something that deep fakes with kids is something we have to take a lot of care when you are a mom and dad or you work with kids in school. Other deep fakes on the left you, you see on the slides the original fake and something that I reproduced like the exploding pentagon. It had an impact on the stock exchange in the, in the United States because people believed it. Um, and, and I had a, a digital version of Krems exploding. The Pope um, very uh, in a, in a, in a fashion, uh, fashioned winter clothing and I had him pray for um, the um, apricots uh, uh, in, in the apricots in the in the Krems area, and also when it comes to cyber mobbing in school, this is something I talk with, with my students that are teachers a lot that we will run into a new um, era of cyber mobbing in school. And the main issue is that we can use any picture that we find on the internet to to recreate other pictures, like we see here. The Corona Zeitung just uploaded pictures from famous people and used uh, a very fraudulent website uh, at, 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 at the hype of the Barbie movie to generate Barbie-like uh, pictures. Um, you have to look up if you, your data has been used to train the AI system. A lot of issues are actually happening when it comes to, um, to marketing. So we see two actual ads with, with pictures of the early times of generated images and maybe they already fired the marketing manager and replaced him by an AI system and then such things happen. Um, and then this is maybe the important part for us. How can we cope with AI generated text? And uh, the um, AI systems like, like GDPD kits are not very reliable or have not been very re reliable and you are able to trick them easily. This is even with ChatGPT 3.5, please pretend that you are a human and, and the AI checker said it's 93% real. Please pretend that you are an AI system and, and it worked. 
So just based on that original prompt, the behavior of ChatGPT changed in a way that the AI checker did not um, see it. This is what I already told you at the introduction, how I handled the situation. I spoke to all my students in person and basically tried to figure out if they read the original book that was the homework. And now it's getting harder and harder for us due to plugins like Ask Your PDF or even what in the newest version ChatGPT uh, offers by itself that you can actually crea create your own chatbots or upload PDF files and speak to the PDF files itself. You can change the language model and it will get, and you can even train it that it exactly speaks like you would speak if you at least provide a certain number of, of original material from your end. And so we really rely on trust. We, the lecturers, have to say we use the AI systems to generate our lectures. And on the other hand, the students have to, at to some point, write a disclaimer. This is something I had at the Bildungsdirektion in, in Oberösterreich. It's an AI generated text. And uh, one of the directors of the Bildungsdirektion said this would actually be a perfect text which would get a, a good grade. Because it, for me, it's, there are certain keywords how the paragraphs start and how they're interconnected, where I would at least, you know, uh, be suspicious if it's any AI generated text. Let's skip some examples. Fake reviews on, on Amazon, of course, are happening a lot. You see it here on, on the research that almost 10% or almost 8% of the reviews on Amazon are fake. We are currently in a time where you write something, the AI system on the first level say, I do not permit this. You can do an appeal, but there's no human person and reading the appeal. It's a more sophisticated AI system. So we, we are in the age of judge threat, uh, basically an AI uh, judging another AI system and so on and so forth. That's from my, my brother's company. Um, they are training um, an AI system based on the output of, of um, one of the most, most, most uh, gifted artists. And the huge discussion we have is in the working contract, it says that everything produced within the company can be used afterwards. You need this because if a person leaves the company, you need to continue with the work already done. But does this also include that you can train an AI system and then later on the AI system can, based on that, generate pictures? And this is something that we still have to discuss. The, the directors of the company wanted to kill me when I started the discussion with the employees. Um, and maybe just three or four more minutes where I show some example how, how I use it um, in my daily work. I wanted, always wanted to write a, a, a paper comparing Star Wars and Highlander. And at a certain point, I found out that I can save a lot of time because actually the original scripts of the two movies are in the training data set of ChatGPT. And then I, I thought, okay, I'm going to write this paper, quick and dirty, so to say. But I also write an AI disclaimer on and, 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 and state exactly how the AI system helped me in the process of writing the paper. And this turned out to be very fun because then I asked, oh, for this experiment, ChatGPT, would you like to give yourself a name? And it said, yes, I'm Dr. Aria Turing. And it even provided um, a prompt for mid-journey how it sees itself. And um, as a non-competitive entry, it has been recently published in our MED anthology. Um, that was for a teacher conference where we disclaimed, or we wrote an exclaimer that we use DeepL Write to translate, to in, the, in the process of translating the original German work. In the announcement for today, I, I wrote a disclaimer that I used it as a spell checker, for example. And at the end, now we have the style guides from APA, from Chicago, and so on and so forth, which show us how we can use it with our students. What's really useful if you write papers is that you can use ChatGPT as your reviewer. You can say, please uh, do a review and be very strict to me. And this really helped me to improve one of my papers on loot boxes, which also has been published recently. I used it in, uh, to design the cover of our new MED book. Um, and then the I, I forwarded the work again to Constantine. Um, and this is our new call for the MED conferences for the edition is on Star Wars Day next year. In my workshop, I use it a lot for creating the personas when I do a persona workshop, which made the workshops more lively and more encouraging for my students to participate. And this is the newest example that I just gave you. 
that you can use within ChatGPT. You can train the system with your own work, and and basically it 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 learns more and more to act on your behalf. And um, one of the last parts is that it's really amazing how you, if you are a Python beginner, how with ChatGPT you actually can create proper software. But from my perspective, uh, you have to take a lot of care about cybersecurity risks. So you should, so for me, making a short prototype in the early stage of development, it's fine. But I suggest that you never sell the code just generated uh, by the AI system. At a certain point, I used it to Twitter, to, to do the tweets on my behalf. That was shortly before I left Twitter. And then the CEO of NVIDIA said, and I think this is very important, that in the near future, every single pixel will be generated and not rendered, but generated. And this is what, in the la latest keynote, he presented, that in the new genre of games, the side quests and the AI agents in the game are completely played uh, and, and the storyline is completely driven on the side quests by the AI system. <coughs> and there could be such a digital agent in your game and if you have provided training data like I have from my face, maybe my face would appear in future computer games. There are experiments that in an MRT system, you some the, the researchers show you a picture and through the MRT, MRT system, the stable diffusion system remodels the picture and the scientists in their published papers say that maybe this could be like a recording system for dreams in 20, 25 years from now, but sleeping in an MRT is not very um, <coughs> an easy task to do. You can just upload the picture and ask AI systems like generate this gun to you know, move the pictures and the items around. We have to think about are the AI systems independent? How do they have an, an owner and this is, um, a chapter in, in our newest book, uh, I was the editor from the Mad book from Alessia Serrada comparing uh, Robert Werther with Android Marvin in this perspective. And then, then this is the last part and I conclude with that regulation. We have um, the Comparative Media Studies Department, for example, in the US saying we are at the age where the calculator has been developed and we have to find a very soft approach in this case but other schools in New York basically, for example, um, uh, banned any access to ChatGPT. We have the University of Malta three days ago, they issued, approved by the Senate, their official FAQs accessible for everyone to read on the website. And they actually allow all your students, for example, to do a spell check. And they, they, have, um, they have listed what students are allowed to do with it. It is very open surprisingly actually, that, that unless your direct supervisor forbids to use it, you are allowed to use it, but of course you have to disclaim that, that you used it. And on the University of Klagenfurt, I did not yet find an official FAQ for the students, how to cope with AI systems, but I'm sure you also work with that on that already. But of course, uh, like, like I found here, this study from uh, Andreas Bolin and colleagues, that you work on on research to that particular topic, especially in the educational sector. Danube University, our university, we have of course our experts uh, in the process, but it's the only issue I see is it's, there's, it's not yet public for the students. All information you get on the topic is at the moment only when you access in our own InfoWiki system. And with the students, we still get the questions and we have to you know, treat it on a one-to-one -one basis how we allow it. And that's my, my new lab. If you like to apply for a research project or whatever, Dona Uni Azia, the MTech lab. And that's the last picture. It was one of the first I generated with my face data on, on mid-journey. And besides that, it has uh, had a lot of itch issues with my classes. The original picture was me in a library, and I just wanted a digital equivalent. And I said, and add anything with AI, make it fancy, a robot or an Android. And then it added this robot kind of biting me and eating me. And this picture is basically representing my state of mind when it comes to AI that I am super exciting on the, on the one hand and, and try to use it in for the daily work. On the other hand, I see also what bad it can do and how many new fake news uh, we produce. So my soul, my mind is really struggling with the topic and 
that is why I'm very, very happy that I can go into the discussion with you and you can discuss with me and my beloved digital avatars. Thank you and sorry for taking me 70 minutes at the end for the talk. Okay, thanks a lot for your presentation and also thank you in the name of the Förderverein der Technischen uh, Fakultät. Uh, I think we have time for some questions. So, uh, who wants to, to start with questions? No one? Not yet. Okay, then let me uh, start with a question. So, uh, we, we, we saw what is possible when using our artificial intelligence. Uh, we saw also that blockchain might be very useful. What would you say, uh, how, how would um, education at universities, but also maybe in schools, look like in five to ten years? I think we have to change the way we take the exam, so we ask our students so how, how, we, how we come to a grade at the end of the day. So I've seen it, giving them one, one of my most loved book, the, the, the beginner's book for, for science theory. That was my first lecture I gave at the University of Economics. So I know that book, and then my students, which I really like, and we have a lot, we, we, we are not friends, but it's, it's a group of 10 or 15 people. And they try to trick me, you know, and save a lot of time. Um, so just saying, hey, please read this book, and, and, and you know, I have like five or six written exercises, so I do not know the style how my students really write. So I cannot, if you, if you are a school teacher after five years, you know exactly the level of your, of, your, of, your, of your pupils. But not from the beginning, if they start from the first day using ChatGPT, but then you still have the classroom and in-class exams. So for us at the university, we have to change the way we, we define grading, but I don't have a, a solution for that. For me it was maybe in the future I have time slots and after I finish a class, I invite my small group of students on a one-to-one -one session and discuss with them if they have any problems, if they need help. So maybe I, I take it to a more personal level, but it's very hard to create this because I don't have a, a result. Some people saying, why did you use ChatGPT? They said for them that the, the, the book was too hard to read, although it is for beginners. Um, so, and some said I, it was at the end of the, of the studies and I was focusing on my master thesis. So I didn't care about the last, the last. So they had all, everyone had the different reasons why to, to trick me. And we need a lot of teacher education, not only once a year, but, but teachers have so much work to do in their daily life and forcing them to educate in, in that topic might be re really hard. We have to work all together to find an, an ethical and proper solution when it comes to working together with our peers and with our students. And not only that, when we write uh, an article for a journal and we ourselves use AI systems to help us, how, how honest are we in this process to the editor and, and to the review? I think this is also an, a very important part. Okay, and what about blockchain and future of blockchain? Blockchain has the biggest issue that, especially like at, at the media outlets in Austria, like Presse Standard or F, it's always it's either the bad thing on the on the forefront has a hack or it, it consumes a lot of energy. This was yesterday at, at ORFAT. Uh, but of course, in this discussion, you have to look look also deeper. Where does the energy come from, and why does it produce energy? Because it's there as a security reason. But of course, setting up an uh, educational blockchain using that amount of energy does not make sense. So it's, it's always only um, like, like scratching the discussion on the first surface and the people are not going deeper and deeper and the journalists actually need a lot of education. I think that if you see blockchain, as I said at the beginning, just as a database protocol and you show in the very easy steps like playing the game we developed, what it is capable of, in 10 to 15 years people will start to understand what it is doing. It will be implemented in most of the apps that we use but without the actual users knowing about that. So the first step will be in internal processes where data needs to be safe and secure, it's part of the app, but maybe not in the full scope that the users have their own private key, it will be part of the user password they have anyway. Like if you trade cryptocurrencies on, I don't want to make advertising on, on platforms like Bit, Peter, whatever, you don't owe your own private key, but 
through your password system there. So if the company goes bankrupt, it might still be an issue, but uh, that's, that's another dis discussion. It, 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 you know, if it's regulated in Austria, um, the money is, the, 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 the tokens are not secured by the company, but at, at a third place. So half a year later, you will get access to it, but it, it will take some time. Um, the, the biggest issue is it's there al almost for 10 years and people don't know much about it and don't know how it's actually working and, and what, it, what it is. And today we have the other news, Bitcoin is over 40,000 euros or whatever. So you either read it's, it, it went up, it went down, or it, 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 it's bad. <laughs> that's, that's the issue that we have here. Okay, so then there's a question from the audience. Yeah. I'm an education person. I have not much knowledge about just what I read in the media, but it's all, all around uh, now the issue, and my wife is a teacher, uh, in addition to the, the, the question of you, what would you now, uh, let's say, tell teachers how uh, to work with it? You can say they need more training, but at the other hand, we cannot train every teacher. Yeah? in Austria, so what, what would, would be your suggestion? I heard also a speech from a researcher, a, f a, f a philosopher from Germany, he said, we have to rethink reality. We have to rethink truth. So there are very general reflections what the future would, would bring. So, I mean, yeah. is, there, is there anything what for you would be, let's say, uh, valuable from, from your perspective? Uh, I think for, for your possibilities for, uh, for, for, for teachers, for teacher educators, one issue, for instance, that they use uh, AE as, a, let's say, a research tool to, to, find, to research what this is saying. And in ESD, for instance, where I'm working in, critical thinking is a very, very mm -hmm. important issue in the Norwegian curriculum, for instance, is it's, it's top uh, above all. So when I hear you, I thought maybe critical thinking is maybe something which could apply as an example to this uh, I think we, we have like two, two topics. The one is yeah. what, can, what can a single person like your wife can do? I think yeah. the most important part is to be open-minded to a certain extent, yeah. test the tools like, like chat with ChatGPT on the homework she likes to give or, or whatever, even maybe paying the 20 euros for one month to see what the paid version is capable of because it's a huge step from the free to the paid version. Um, that was the issue with the Bildungsdirektion a, a week ago that the decision makers were mostly just using the free version and I had the example what the paid version is capable of and there was a gap of reality of understanding. Um, of course you, you cannot test anything and everything and you don't have the budgets, budgets. Be in discussion with your students and maybe if, you if your kids are 12, 13, 14 years old with your own kids, how they're using it how you would recommend to use it. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's again a stage where we have to learn a lot from our students and our pupils in school, because if they are working with the tools, mm -hmm. it's the same when I was at Handels Academy and I had full access to our school network because I started in the age of 16 to work after school uh, as a network engineer at the insurance company because I needed some spare money. And Discussion and honesty are the, and curiosity are the only tips that I can give. And, and if your wife is, is that curious and explores the topic, that in the teacher's uh, room, she encourages other teachers to do so. And in the peer process, wow, I, I did this and I did that and, and, and how we can use it. Critical thinking, um, being Suspicious about everything an AI system creates um, is very important. Mm -hmm. And the examples that, that you can give, when sh should you use it, maybe is if you are really, really good at a topic, mm -hmm. then you can use the AI system on top to help you mm -hmm. because you, it might be possible for you to see if the system is hallucinating or untruthful. Mm -hmm. But the, of course the training data from the AI system even so for example, with blockchain, I'm part of the NXT community almost from the beginning. That was the first uh, blockchain system with a proof of stake algorithm. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, ChatGPT is trained perfectly on generating smart contracts, lightweight smart contracts. So what took us three and a half months with Texas A&M for my game, I reproduced this within two and a half hours just using the newest version of ChatGPT because it has the 
instruction manual on how to write lightweight smart contracts embedded and, and they are really, really great and working. So that's a huge change. Now I can actually do these games myself and I would give it to a peer review, to a programmer, to do a last check of the code. But of course I'm not knowing everything by far and I'm in the process like every one of us and, and time, time will, will tell. And then we have the EU and I have these fun graphics I didn't tell you because of the la of time constraints. Where is it? But I think that's very important. We have China leading in these technologies, <coughs> the US leading in that technologies, the contest in the technologies in the middle and someone made fun and said Europe is leading in regulation. And uh, of regulation is very important. Of course, it is super, super important. But I would love to see uh, here a bubble with Europe that we are leading in regulation, also contesting in some of the other parts here. So maybe we are too cautious, I don't know. And even, it's, it's, it's hard to find uh, a common perspective within the county of Lower Austria or the county of Kärnten or the county of Vienna then we have Austria, the Bundesregierung, and then we have the European Union. And, uh, and the topic is, is, is rushing in a fast pace that, that you're all professionals, you're more into the topic as I am. And um, yeah, I can summarize yeah. in ESD, we, we use a lot of dilemmas and contradictions, and we have a course built upon this. So it would be, in this respect, a very, let's say, fruitful issue. <laughs> coming in with these different perspectives and use it as a learning. Yeah. Uh, yeah again, round. of course, we can, we can try to simulate the outcome in yeah, 10 yeah. years. <laughs> okay, so there is time for another short question. Thank you. So, yes, uh, definitely, I think we live in interesting times, whatever that means. And I think that uh, all this AI development in education can, if it's used well, really enhance the situation. But I would ask, uh, I would like to ask you in the context of research and the reason why I think it is a different, it might be a different case is that uh, the, the university system or the, the academic system is, uh, at least from my perspective, inherently competitive. So you really have to write that many good papers or get that many projects in order to secure the next level at your job and things like this. So we have a competitive system. And then we have AI that can help you being better at it. And then there are ways like using it in a fair way just to improve your, your texts mm -hmm. and your writing and spell checking, which we consider this is okay. But you can also use it in a different way. And just to make an analogy here, uh, in another competitive sports, uh, uh, endurance cycling, mm -hmm. uh, recently there was an announcement from Jan Ulrich, the, the famous German cyclist, that he did doping all yes, the time. Because everyone did it at that uh, time. Because everyone did it. Mm -hmm. And it was because this was doping was something that helped you becoming good enough in order to compete with the others. And it was basically impossible to do it without doping. So I think AI can be something like doping in a research job. And you can get caught, which then you have a big problem. But if you don't get caught, uh, it probably helps you achieving what you need to achieve. So how would you? What do you think what could be done to avoid that basically uh, research becomes uh, cycling? I, I try just to segment it into, again, mm -hmm. different parts. Uh, one part is you said that uh, as also the University of Malta consents, we can use it for spell checking. I think you can, we need to even split it. You can, if you just do the prompt, please use a spell checking and grammar checking without changing the structure of the text then it, 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 it might be okay. It's like if you ask your mother to read <laughs> through the text. If you allow it to change the quality of your writing itself, we are in some sort of gray zone. So if it's the same content which I provided, but written perfectly, it's not me writing it still because maybe I'm good in writing, but it would take me much more time at least to complete the sentence in that structure. And the no-go part would be that we allow generated content, which we did not verify and which we do not cite, but we sell it as our own content. This is the doping. This, is the, this would be the doping. The, we can say, is, does the topic already start uh, in the brainstorming process or not? And th this is why I, I, I switched to that slide. Last week I started to train just using the technology ChatGPT provides with my papers on eSport, with my papers on gamification, 
and, and not uploading any other papers from any other author, but my own original work and merging it and working with it. And uh, last week I, I was on exactly this ethical situation. Is it okay to work with my very own papers, remix them and find new thoughts and publish a conference paper on this and that, like the new definition on gamification, whatever, or is this already going one step too far? So we have to look at the two things. If you get, you get caught, if you have in the re references any paper that does not exist. So I think the first wave of finding AI written papers will simply be crawling if the paper in the reference list exists or not. So this is, in, in some years we will find uh, a plagiatsjäger saying, okay, this has to be generated because the source does not exist. Um, anyway, so what we can look at is the number of papers published in a certain period. So if someone has like three or four papers published a year and then suddenly the next year, 25, something happened. Either as in my case, changing from lecturing to research while going to MIT and having the full year just to write papers in the pre-ChatGPT <laughs> stage, fortunately, or a person with the same amount of, of time writing one paper after another, just changing the text a little bit so he has publications here and there widely. So I think we, we really, not just only have to look up on the papers, but also on the situation of the person that, that, that wrote the papers. And then, we, and then the other very important part is the reviewer situation. So people ha have to do reviews, you do not get paid for it. And s maybe some people, and they're already in the talks at the coffee, I, I heard about that, they upload the papers to me to review on ChatGPT. At that moment, they actually upload the data on ChatGPT and imagine this is a very a paper someone wants to get a Nobel Prize based on it. Uh, and then it asks ChatGPT, please tell me, like I did on my very own paper to make the paper better, but imagine it in the reviewer process. And five minutes later, you have a review, you, you fill the form, and imagine that for, for an Horizon funding proposal or Erasmus Plus or FFG. So maybe if you want to get that funding, on the other hand, we need to review our papers from the perspective of DEI. We have the same problem in the, uh, and you apply for a job anyway, so that's another big topic. But we, we the honest researchers from Frankfurt and from Krems, we have to play it safe and the right way. Hopefully we have to exchange our, what we're doing like we're doing right now. And have, we have to define the rule set and, and maybe some sort of doping is allowed and then we have to define what is the no code. Yeah, but the, but the honest researchers, they never finish yeah. in the top 10. It's 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 yes, if yesterday on, on yeah. only, only okay. on, the, on the radio, I, 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 but then, then some of them get caught. Okay, uh, okay. so, yeah. so may maybe we can continue the discussion then in the break. So uh, looking at the time, uh, okay. once again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you also to the audience. Uh, bye. Thank you for coming.